Hello everyone and welcome to week seven of the Business Web Practices Speaker Series. Today I'm honored to introduce to you Clark College's very own Feline Gaylord. <laughs> Thank you for that warm welcome. All right, so in this talk, I'm just going to describe a little bit about my own journey from a designer to developer and then share some of the lessons I learned along the way that I put into place now in my own business. So basically, I've been in business for myself since uh, 2009. I actually started freelancing in 2004, but um, I did it full time since 2009 and um, have had to learn a lot of things the hard way. So, shall we begin? So every job, has a lesson to teach you. I, I've been keeping this running tally of all of the jobs I've ever worked. I'm up to 33 now <laughs> since 1971. Um, a, a lot of them are design jobs, but a lot of them are, you know, just kind of the jobs you get to kind of keep going in life and um, keep moving on. So the worst job I ever worked was a plastic molding machine operator. I lasted two days. Noisy, smelly, hot, sticky plastic. Ugh, it was just, it was, it was really not my idea of fun. Or, it's a tie. I worked in a fish packing factory filleting fish for one day. And that was about as much as I could take. And luckily, I got called to be a waitress the next day. So I was so glad. But, working jobs like that, you end up, you know, learning what you can and cannot put up with just how to survive and what you need to do to kind of keep things going. My best job is what I'm doing right now. I'm working for myself as an owner of, you know, owner, designer, developer for Sirius Media in Portland, Oregon. And we build um, websites. I focus on small websites and mostly for small businesses. But I also will work with nonprofits and various entities like uh, government you know, agencies and stuff. My second best job is teaching here at Clark College. Sorry, it's second best, but it, I, I really love to work for myself. So let's start at the very beginning. In 1972, I had just graduated from high school. I had been on art staff at um, my local high school and had learned a little bit about silk screening and doing layout for posters and We'd put the programs together for, you know, the various theatrical productions and uh, occasional posters. So I had a little bit of graphic design education and a little bit of skills. In Chicago, which was a huge printing hub at the time, I could dive into entry level layout paste up jobs. So my first job was to do layout paste up for a place called that printed the Stick, Stickney Berwyn Cicero Life newspapers. And they were local papers, like, you know, some of the p local papers around here came out once a week. Everything was uh, printed out in big long sheets of type and then you'd cut it up and you'd, you know, use your X-Acto knife and T-squares and triangles to get it all placed. And then after the page was, was put together, and you had what was called a mechanical, you'd take it into the copy camera and they'd take a picture of it. That was a, a really great education to just kind of get started with. I got to do a little bit of design work because there wasn't you know, time to hire anybody else to do it. Uh, it was very stressful. My boss was always yelling and he had had half of his stomach removed by the time I was working for him due to ulcers. So this was not totally the direction I wanted to be heading. My next job was working for a, as a film cutting artist for a silk screen printer and they, they silk screened real estate signs. And so this was very much a, a skill of manual dexterity to, we had this film called Ruby Lith, we put it out there and then we'd have you know, type either drawn underneath it, and so we'd have to cut out perfect O's and perfect S's out of this film, and then you'd peel the film off, and that would be used to 
create silkscreen. That was it, more fun and definitely, you know, a little more creative, less stress. So, I got, I got the big idea to move out to Oregon. And I came out to Oregon and all of a sudden it hit me that these jobs were not available for me. That any graphic design jobs that existed out here were being competed for by, guess what? People who had moved in from back east with college degrees. <laughs> so, so I was competing against a lot of other people who, um, many of which were, were new to the town, but they had gotten an education and they'd gotten some skill sets in um, agencies back east. So it really kind of put me at a disadvantage. So in 1976, I decided to go back to school. And that's what I looked like in 1976. <laughs> so I took sign painting and layout paste up classes at Lynn Benton Community College, started at community college first. And um, just to, to get a little bit of credentials, a little bit of, you know, authorization that yes, I had these skills. And guess what? I actually learned a bunch of new stuff too. <laughs> so. Um, then I started doing calligraphy, lettering, sign painting, um, and started getting a few freelance clients. I painted um, signs around Corvallis. I did hand-lettered menus. I did the classic kind of hippie posters with letters that you couldn't read and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. So luckily, in, um, this as a result of my layout paste up job, I got a job at the Albany Democrat Herald for the summer doing ad layout and paste up there. I didn't get to design anything because the ad sales reps designed stuff, but it just gave me a little bit more production experience. And finally, I was kind of back where I had been three years ago with, you know, my, my jobs and my career. So, a couple of years later, I finally decided to get serious and go for a four-year degree. I went back to school again and studied graphic design at the University of Oregon, um, right after Animal House was made. That was actually, I saw Animal House the day before registration. So it just kind of set the tone there. Um, Meanwhile, while I was at the U of O, I did waitress jobs, but I also worked at a um, ad newspaper called The Big Dealer, doing layout, ad design, and cartooning. Now, The Big Dealer was not a prestigious publication. It was kind of like nickel ads, but with a few pictures. So, um, but the good thing is that they actually let me um, go in and you know work on design work and just, um, be a little bit creative and they liked having the cartoons. So that was, uh, that was actually a, a good opportunity for me. 1979, I moved to PSU. So uh, U of O was changing their graphic design program to a more general visual design one. And I really wanted something very specific to graphics. So, and my boyfriend was moving up to Portland. So I decided to uh, come on up to Portland, a uh, state where actually I felt very comfortable in the community there and found a really wonderful graphic design program. The cool part about being at PSU is my work study job, I got to be a graphic design assistant at the audiovisual department. And this was in 1979 to 1980, 81. One of the things that was happening during that period of time is Mount St. Helens was erupting. One of our jobs in the visual audiovisual department was to develop the film that any of the professors took as part of their, you know, research, their studies. So we had the geography professors going up in helicopters every day, flying over Mount St. Helens, and they'd come back and they'd give us their film and my boss would take it into the dark room and he'd bring it out, put the slides out. So we were the first people that got to see the slides of any activity on Mount St. Helens. In this day, we are so used to instant information coming at us all the time, but the whole 
drama of being able to be the first ones to see those slides were really cool. I also got a lot of experience of just working with uh, the professors and learning how to, um, you know, listen to what their requirements were, meet their needs, and really kind of um, focus on providing a skill set that they really were looking for. So after school, I worked at a company called MNI, Mike Nichols Incorporated, and it was my first real design job. I was so excited. Actually, right before this job, I sold dog licenses door to door. <laughs> so, you know, kind of, you know, kind of goes from one to the other. But uh, so I was a graphic designer there. And basically, I got to do the company branding. I established their logo, which actually they're still using. And um, I got to work on multi-language design projects. So he was uh, doing training in Saudi Arabia or Korea. And so for each of those, I'd have to um, put together a Korean business card, Saudi Arabia, you know, and like find the typesetter who can set that and find somebody who can proofread it because you met, you know, or we did Korean, Japanese and, and Arabic. So that was a real fun project. I got to design their trade show booth. So um, that was something I'd never done before and got to figure out it's like, oh, we have these panels and here's the logo and make it really big and gold. And I did a lot of cartooning for um, this job as well. And, um, oh, the slides for five different courses. So each course had anywhere from 50 to 120 overhead slides that he'd carry around in this big suitcase. <laughs> and so for, you know, just like with the overhead projectors, um, you know, you'd have to put these on there and stuff. So just kind of compiling all of that and, you know, was a, a lot of work to keep track and make sure they were all in order. But in 1986, my world changed because he bought a Macintosh. And the Macintosh, we were able to use it to do page layout for all of his various, each, each seminar had a booklet. So all the various booklets, multi-page booklets that we had, that it was so fun that the page numbers were automatically there because we were cutting out like little page numbers and having to stick them on individual pages before we got the Mac. So the fact that this did pagination was like so cool. And then we got to, um, so I used programs like Ready, Set, Go was the first page layout program that I used and Corel Draw. I remember this, you know, the window on that Mac was like, so little, you couldn't even see an entire page, even the entire width of a page on it. But it was just groundbreaking and so fun. So, 1989, I started working at TriMet. So I worked at TriMet for 15 years and really kind of, um, you know, went from, from one era of design work to um, to another one. So when I got to work there, all of the maps were done with, you know, mechanical. So we had layers of acetate and we'd put the, the bus routes down on tape and we'd get like the labels for each street and kind of like, you know, put them out there. And it was very time consuming, really tedious. So I got hired because I could use a computer and I knew the drawing programs. I had to share the computer with one of my coworkers when I first started there, because they only had one in the department. So Jeff got a few hours and I got a few hours and then we'd have to fight over about who got to do what. So, um, but, so some of the firsts that I got to initiate for TriMet is the very first desktop published brochure, which is in 1990. Um, I still have a copy of it. Uh, so a GIS based system map. So that was really innovative when they started to actually use GIS uh, tracking on the buses to begin with. 
And then they actually started to um, use that information to input the bus routes and to lay, overlay that on the database that we got from Metro. Um, so that was very interesting. I got to initiate a website, the very first website with a trip planner on the homepage, the very first online store for tickets and passes. And we got to um, help design the interactive map user interface. So when we're developing this interactive map user interface, Google Maps hadn't, hadn't even launched yet. And so we were like looking at this interface trying to figure out, it's like, okay, so if you have a, a little zoom thing here on the side, does zooming up mean you're moving out or moving in? So some of these very basic decisions that seem so intuitive now, somebody had to decide those at some point. And so um, it was really a, a great challenge to, to try and figure out what are the things that are going to be um, really useful about this. Within two years from when I was working on that, Google had uh, worked with TriMet to be the very first trans agency to put bus routes on Google Maps. So, and then the last, my last accomplishment while I was there is um, 2002 or three, we did the first phone app, and I said smartphone app here, and actually it was a feature phone, you know, we didn't have smartphones back, but it was a feature phone app that you could actually do trip planning and find when their bus was coming and that was right before the Interstate Max launched in 2004. So one of the challenges for designing that was that, um, you know, you can only do one decision step at a time when you're on a phone, you know. You can assume that on a, on a laptop you can do, you know, a couple of different things, but on the phone, particularly on phones that weren't smartphones, you could only do one, one step, one decision at a time. I remember at the time my boss said, oh, this isn't gonna be very popular. People aren't going to, going to want to wait for that information and pay for the extra data. And I was like, no, this is your killer app. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, you look at all the various um, apps that have been developed with TriMet uh, data because it's publicly available. And it's just, it, it's amazing to see what people have done. And I personally am a huge fan of the, the ticket app. So, so this was what the TriMet website looked like when I first started working on it. This was my first website I ever worked on. You can see that um, it's not very graphical. I mean, this is 1996. It took forever to download a picture in 1996. And, it's really hard to tell what is the most important out of all of these. All of these different um, options are presented in equal value. And it's not even clear what, how we get there matters it takes you to. You know, it's like, oh, okay, here's how we get there matters. What does that mean? So, anyway, it was a challenge. So my first Part, my role in that particular website is taking all of the route maps for the 89 routes that we had and turning them into GIFs and placing them on the, the web page. So here are a few of the other projects I was involved in while I was at TriMet. Um, the one at the top is a piece of the Interstate Max um, safety campaign because the, the max line there goes past two grade schools. And they were so concerned that kids were gonna be running out in front of the max train and not really taking it seriously. So we developed this whole safety campaign that was, you know, kind of like aimed at teenagers trying to be really hip. So the bus passes there down in the corner are um, just examples of bus pass art. We used to really have fun with the bus pass art. 
And now they've turned into, you know, this thing that costs you $100 and, and you get like nothing. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so the map down there in the corner is an example of the, the system map that I was responsible for every year. And each system map would print 250,000 copies. So when I tell people that I printed millions of maps for TriMet, it literally in four years, there were a million. And I was there for a lot longer than that. So this piece is a piece of information design that I did um, outlining how the um, interstate max was going to be constructed. And I don't know if you've ever attended any of Edwin Tufte's um, seminars about information design, but he has cited that um, to have four variables of information shown in relationship to each other is like really a masterpiece. This one has five. So this is still, it takes a while to look at it to kind of figure out what all is there, but um, it really was useful for the engineers as we, you know, progressed, they could see what stage each uh, element of the Max Line project was at. And this was the, um, the home page that I designed um, as the lead designer. So this was like the third iteration of the TriMet website. And it, you know, it was a situation where we kind of had to compete with the other designers in the department every time the redesign came up. But we had been doing usability studies and we had been looking at user experience by that time and really had an idea that what people really wanted from the website was information on how to ride the bus. And I'd go into these meetings with the executives and they'd be like, well, why isn't there more marketing information on there? We need, you know, people need to know about the annual report. I'd be like, people don't care about your annual report. So I'm um, just trying to get them to think in terms of serving the customer with their information rather than all the information being about us, uh, being about us as a company, was really a struggle. And I really had to stand up and advocate for my idea on several occasions. And uh, you really get buy-in from my bosses to support this idea. But after we did this, that um, this uh, website actually won a national award from the Federal Transit Association. I know it looks so clunky now, but you know, it's like, <laughs> really this, nobody else had a trip planner on the homepage. So it was, it was really, uh, you know, satisfying uh, victory for me. So I was getting into doing all this web development stuff at TriMet and, you know, I'd taken like an HTML class. I was like, you know, I really like this this multimedia stuff. I want to go back and get some certification in, in this particular area. So I went back to school in 1996 to 1998 um, to Portland State and got a multimedia professional certificate. We studied a lot about user interface design. We studied a lot about how graphics for interactions, um, multimedia programming, Flash animation, learned how to use Macromedia Director, which is a program nobody ever hears of now. <laughs> and basically, all of our projects were based on being software that, that would be located on a CD that people would run. There was some acknowledgement of web you know, as being a way to deliver this. But once again, because the bandwidth was so bad and um, it just took people, you know, took things forever to download, it really was not considered the major focus of this program. So all of my HTML, all was learned outside of this, this particular program. But I got a certificate. And the thing is, is that all of those concepts 
still apply to what I'm doing today. I mean, they really were fundamental concepts of interactive media, no matter how it's delivered. So the fact that the software has changed, and now nobody likes Flash, <laughs> is, you know, that really doesn't matter because the design concepts are still what is um, following through. It underlies everything that we're doing now. So from there, I went to the OHSU Center for Women's Health. Um, there, I was a senior project manager of graphic design. I was the webmaster. I did brochures. Um, we were the first to use email newsletters for outreach. That was considered very radical. Like, oh no, people won't read it if it's not in print. Well, they don't read it if it's in print either, so. Um, so we did an online searchable database for women's health. We supported the Women's Health Research Unit in their um, search for um, people to participate in their programs and to um, print the results of their various uh, studies that they did. We had an annual Women's Health Conference, which I helped with uh, PowerPoints and graphics. And then we also did monthly free health events at Nordstrom's for women. Very interesting place to work. I loved working up at OHSU because I was smarter than the doctors in something. <laughs> they didn't know how to use PowerPoint. Half of them couldn't, you know, they couldn't use a computer. Even, you know, this is the mid 2000s. A lot of them went, I don't know, I just never got time to do it. So, um, so they'd come to me and I could help these doctors do things. And also then I was able to learn from them because there were opportunities to you know, attend talks, attend free talks on campus all, every week. And sometimes I'd go and I wouldn't really understand what they were talking about, but still you know, I would get something out of it. It was actually a, a very interesting environment to be part of. So, and then 2006, I moved up here to the Couv and started working for J.D. White, which uh, evolved into Berger ABAM engineers. So when I started working at J.D. White, they were a consulting agency for um, land use, public involvement, and environmental consulting. So they had clients that were both on the public side, so Clark County, City of Vancouver, Port of Washougal, um, the Cowlitz Tribe, um, Port of Kalama, were all various clients that we had. And then also a lot of uh, developers and private entities that needed environmental or land use concerns. So in that case, I was hired to do website de de design and development as part of their package. I supported the other agency, the other parts of the team with maps and print design. I learned how to do estimates and proposals. I learned how to plan a project. And I learned about time tracking. Arr! So, I tell you, the, the estimates, proposals, project planning, and time tracking were very difficult things for me to learn. I was so used to kind of like diving in as a you know graphic designer. It's like, oh, let's do a few sketches or let's r run around and, and you know play with this and play with that and see what happens. And especially when I was an in-house designer at TriMet or OHSU, I ha was able to spend as much time as I wanted as long as we met the regular deadlines, which usually were kind of like three months out. But there were times I would redo a brochure 14, 16, 18 times just because the marketing rep didn't like that color of blue this week and wanted me to try something else. So time tracking put a whole different spin on things and it was really a discipline that I hadn't been exposed to before so it was very hard for me to learn. Um, and just planning a project and figuring out how, you know, time tracking is the base of planning a project because if you don't know how much time something takes, you're not going to know how much time to estimate. You're not going to know, you know, in a proposal, 
If you're competing against somebody else, you want to make sure there's enough time to cover all of the tasks, but also, you know, not too much. So, because you don't want to overprice when you're comparing it to somebody else because you're always bidding against other bidders. So, there are a lot of things I learned about running a business and being in business at this job that um, were very hard won lessons. And quite frankly, I ended up getting fired out of that job <laughs> because of the downturn and I wasn't having enough billables coming in. And um, also just, you know, little things like uh, my time tracking wasn't accurate enough. So, but some of the projects that we got to do there are, so the one up on the left is a legal law office. Uh, so the Eugene City Hall Master Plan is a website. Um, the one down in the left-hand corner is, is Riverwalk. So that was for a, a development that was going to happen in uh, Camas and didn't. And then, of course, the one down on the right is the Cowlitz Casino Resort, which is now actually starting to get, you know, get approval. Stuff like that. So, so in 2009, they let me go. And I had very mixed feelings about it. It wasn't as creatively satisfying as I wanted. I was very frustrated with my inability to meet their standards with the, the time tracking and some of the other aspects. But I, you know, was really ready to kind of dive into my own business. As a matter of fact, I had already started talking to a small business development uh, center counselor. So the SBDC is this federal agency that exists um, all over and you can actually get free counseling if you want to start a business and they will sit down and help you go through the steps so by the time they had let me go I'd already gotten my assumed business name I had a separate business account I kind of knew which direction I was going in and had figured out a target market so the day they let me go actually I was meeting with my small business counselor so instead of being five years down the road, all of a sudden my project was going to happen now, but it, you know, I was ready for it, so that was good. So, since 2009, I have been the principal of what I call Creative in Chief, that's my job title, at Sirius Media. Um, I run it out of my house. Um, right now I have one assistant that I work with, um, you know, she works with me anywhere from five to 20 hours a week, kind of depending on what we're up to. And um, basically, I focus on building smart websites for small businesses, nonprofits, and individuals using WordPress. I still do work on HTML sites. I don't develop in HTML anymore. And I have never been a um, good backend coder. PHP is not my area of expertise. So I'm very happy working with WordPress. One of the things I love about my business is that I work with this huge range of clients, ranging from this trout farm, to backhoe operators, to uh, jazz singers. I have a mermaid spiritual counselor on Kauai. I have a chiropractors, veterinary brokers, wool shops, t-shirt designers, you know, I, I figured out that in my list of websites that I have worked on, there's over 100 now and just such a wide range of people. I really love to be able to support um, people in business for themselves and people that are, um, you know, just making their, their own vision come true. So. These are just kind of a few of the websites that I have been working on here uh, for my clients. So up left is a lighting designer, a weaver, my jazz singer friend, a business consultant, and a photographer. So here we go. And so how am I doing on time? You got about five minutes. 
Okay, great. All right, so let me get to, I have 10 nuggets of business wisdom to share. All right, so the first one is fill your clients' needs. Find a service that is important to others and fill that need. Try and focus on one particular service that you do really well and let people know that that's what you're up about. I can do logo design, calligraphy, all sorts of stuff, but I really focus on just building websites. If people need logos, I can add that. Check in with your clients often. So make sure that they know that you're listening. Um, and even if you're late, just let them know what you're doing so that they know that, you know, what's going on. Back it up and lock it down. Keep your system secure. Make sure you back up everything. You know, you can't say that enough. And make sure your websites are have extra security running. Make sure that your host is secure if you have your website on a host because there's nothing worse than having to restore a hacked website. Ask for help if you need it. There are a lot of people out here who are have different skills than you, are more advanced in one area or another. This um, school is a great place to connect with others. Keep your tools sharp. So, I, you know, originally I was thinking of this metaphor as being like my X-Acto knives when I was first getting started. You, you know, can't work with a dull X-Acto knife. You can't work with a rapidograph that is clogged with ink. But it also applies to all the educational opportunities. Take advantage of everything that you can because um, everything, technology and data are changing daily. So after you get out of school, be sure that you're going to workshops that you take place, and, you know, connect with user groups and do seminars and take online training because the one thing I can guarantee you is everything's going to change. So keep up with book work. If you're in business for yourself, keep up with the book work because uh, that takes a lot of time. Take some time off. I know that so many people who are in business for themselves end up working, 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 working like 10, 12 hours a day and they work on Saturday and they work on Sunday and then they end up getting so burned out after a year because they don't have your, any time. It's better for your person, your health, and you can think better when you have some time off. Take a walk, get out and take a walk. You know, just take Sundays, turn the, turn the phone off. So develop your toolkit, find some themes, find some techniques, find some, you know, code snippets that, that you can rely on, that you know how they work and you can use in a bunch of different ways. So you have a toolkit of things to rely on. And then find your synthesis. So partner, find somebody to partner with. If you're really good at one particular type of coding, but you suck at e-commerce, find somebody else who works really well with e-commerce, but they don't want to get out there and find the jobs. So find somebody that you can synthesize with and both of your businesses will grow. And then don't be afraid to fail. This is actually a wall on in the Whedon and Kennedy offices downtown. And one of the stories that Dan Whedon told at the first creative conference I went to is how all of his successes have been built on failures. That to actually go and do some of the great creative stuff that they do, they had to try a bunch of other stuff that didn't work. And even in the various approach to when he was starting the business, he had all these failures, but each failure gave him an insight and it gave him something to work with for the next thing. Oh, avoid that. Oh, don't do that. Oh, spend more time on this. So they have made it a motto at Whedon and Kennedy to fail harder. And if you don't have failures in your performance review, you're actually downgraded for not having failures during the year. So. I'm not telling you that you should go out and totally mess up. I'm just saying, don't be afraid if it happens because that's how some of the best opportunities are given to us. That's how my business got started. And that's how, you know, I've learned everything I've 
learned here. And thank you for your time. Okay. Is there any time for questions? Sure. Is, are, does anybody have any questions? Barry? Go back. Oh, keep up with bookwork. <laughs> yeah, what I use so for uh, time tracking is an online tool called Harvest. Harvestapp.com, uh, I believe, is the tool. FreshBooks also works really well, but it just gives you a really easy way to um, do estimates, time tracking, and invoices. I think it's like 12 bucks a month for me, and it is so worth it because it saves me a bunch of time. Yes? Uh, I did have a question regarding images. For your website, the images you use, do you purchase them, or do you just use the basic Google images? Um, well, first of all, you can't trust any image that you just find on Google to be copyright free. So any image that I use on a website for myself or my client, either it's something that I took or I have bought from a stock agency. One more? Yeah, I was like curious, what kind of tools do you use for like image processing and for layouts? Well, for the most part, I use Photoshop for any image processing, and I use WordPress for um, you know the structure of my site. One more? Great. One more, yes? Well, the, the, basically, you have, it all has to start with networking. And one of the other things I was going to say is realize that at every job, everywhere you are, any kind of social connection, you're building your network. So if, you know, the people you meet here at school or if you, you know, belong to a, you know, model train club or, you know, you worked in your neighborhood association, all those people are all, you know, people that when you get started, you let them know. Um, also, joining business networking groups really helps because you find other people that are in business that need what you have. So definitely pay attention to business network, you know, small business networking groups and like chamber of commerce kind of meetings and stuff like that. Cool. Okay, well, so, thanks again, Feline. All right. <laughs>